Good morning and welcome to our Sunday morning service for the Lebanon Church of Christ in Dresden, Tennessee. Uh, this pre-recorded service is being made available for Sunday, uh, June 23rd, 2024. And we are almost done with the month of June we have today. Uh, and Lord willing, next Sunday, June 30th, we'll be meeting together on that fifth Sunday. Uh, it is a blessing to be able to be here uh, and to be with you. Uh, if you're in Weekly County or in our surrounding area here in Northwest Tennessee, uh, we would love to see you in person today. Uh, Lord willing, we'll have our services uh, with our Sunday school classes at 9 o'clock this morning, uh, followed by our worship at 10. That's where I'll share the same message that we'll uh, have here in just a moment. Uh, and then, Lord willing, tonight at 5 p.m., uh, we'll have our discussion Bible study. And in that 5 o'clock uh, service, uh, we've been uh, talking about the church and kind of building on the basics. You know, what do we know about the church uh, from Scripture? What do we uh, understand about the church from our own experiences and traditions that we've grown up in? And how do we blend those two things together uh, in a way that we can truly be uh, God's people today uh, in the world that needs uh, the message of Jesus, that needs the gospel of Christ? Uh, how can we be a church that, that offers that and facilitates that and welcomes people into uh, the family of God in that way? So we're excited about that study. Uh, and tonight, Lord willing, we're going to look a little bit at uh, how the church as a whole, universal, uh, through time and the local congregation are connected uh, and related. Uh, a lot of things going on in the religious world uh, about the connections between the larger church uh, and individual churches or congregations. And so we want to talk about that and, and share some thoughts on that tonight. So uh, if you can, uh, be with us in person. Uh, join us at 9, 10, and 5 today. As far as our service here online, uh, I'll begin here in just a moment with a word of prayer. Uh, and then we'll follow that up uh, with a lesson from God's Word. Uh, we're in the midst of our whatever series, uh, whatever things are uh, true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just. And today we find ourselves uh, there in Philippians 4.8 uh, with whatever things are pure. And so we'll be talking about that for a few moments. Uh, we'll have a moment to reflect. And if you're at home with your family or maybe watching in the nursing home or hospital, uh, whatever the situation may be, uh, I'll offer a couple of prayers that you can use there uh, as you take the Lord's Supper together, if you're doing that today. Uh, and then we'll have some announcements uh, and be dismissed uh, in prayer. Uh, so thankful that you were able to be here with us today uh, and to join in uh, this time of uh, coming to God's Word. Uh, if you're watching this later in the week and it's not your primary uh, Sunday worship, uh, that's great too. Uh, I hope that you can benefit from this and be able to share it uh, perhaps with others if it's been a blessing to you. Let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer and then we'll step into uh, our lesson time together. Let's pray. Our Lord and our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this day and thankful for the opportunity that we have to use the technology that brings us together uh, and help us to be in this time uh, focused on your word. Help us to lay aside the, the things that would distract and the cares of the world for just a few moments that we might be strengthened, that we might think on holy and pure things and, and be drawn closer into relationship with you. Lord, we're thankful for your word, uh, the Bible that equips us uh, as we live from day to day. Help us to always engage with it and uh, grow from it and benefit from it as we study and, and read and and uh, talk about it uh, together from day to day. We're thankful, Lord, for our congregation at Lebanon and for all the faithful congregations of your people who are uh, in our area and all around the world today who are coming together uh, to lift you up, coming together to be encouraged and edified. And we just ask that we would do that in a way that honors you uh, as we meet together today. We pray, Lord, for those who are sick and those who we will name here in just a few moments that are known to our whole congregation. But we also pray for those that we may know of individually who are hurting, whether it's sickness or uh, long-term uh, illness, people who are struggling with mental health, people who are uh, facing down uh, addiction today, uh, people who are taking care of loved ones who are uh, aging or who may have special needs. And whatever the situation that these folks are in, uh, we ask that your hand would be present and that if we have opportunity, that you would make us aware of ways that we can uh, serve and minister to the people around us. Uh, there are so many people who are hurting, um, so many people who are lost, so many people who uh, feel scattered and overwhelmed, and we ask that our eyes would be open to help them. Lord, we pray for uh, our missionary uh, families that are all throughout the world today, especially those that we support at Lebanon, and whether those works are here in our own country or uh, far across the sea, uh, we ask that you would continue to bless each one of those 
uh, individuals in each one of those families. Bless the people that they are seeking to minister to, the people that they are seeking to reach with the gospel. May there be effective uh, doors that are open uh, before them, and may they have the strength and the courage to, to continue to share the gospel in difficult places. We pray, Lord, also for those who are serving today, the physical needs of others, doctors and nurses and first responders and law enforcement, people who day in and day out are sacrificing themselves for uh, our community, and we just ask that you would strengthen them in their work today. Lord, we pray for this summer season and all the special events that are going on, the Vacation Bible Schools and church camps, gospel meetings, summer series, uh, all the special efforts that congregations are doing uh, and that individuals are doing to bring people closer to you. We ask that those would be blessed and that you would strengthen the hands of those who are laboring in those uh, efforts this week. We pray, Lord, also for our country and for our community, for our leaders. Be with us in this election year as we're selecting new leaders uh, to guide us uh, in difficult times. Uh, we pray also that we might be able to uh, look to you for guidance and direction in our own lives and in all the decisions that we make uh, that affect others. Uh, help us to always uh, put the principles of your word uh, as a guiding, uh, as a guiding uh, practice in our lives. We ask, Lord, that uh, you would help us to have a sense of your holiness, a sense of your purity. And as we recognize in ourselves our shortcomings and our failings, we would ask that you would help us to be strengthened, to recognize them and to turn from them, and to give ourselves more fully to you. We realize that that forgiveness is not possible without our relationship with Christ, his willingness to come and live among us, the Spirit's presence with us in the Word and in our daily lives. And Lord, we just ask that in all we do, we would give you the glory and honor that we would renounce uh, our selfishness and our sinfulness, and we would turn once again to you. Bless us as we study together today. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, again, good to uh, be with you and to share this time uh, together uh, this morning. As I mentioned, we're talking about uh, in our, our series of lessons this summer, uh, the things that we are told to think about, the things that we're told to meditate on, uh, so that the God of peace will be with us, so that we will be strengthened in our relationship with God and in our relationship with other believers. And there's a several, several different times that those type of uh, lists or those type of uh, wording that happens in the New Testament, but we've been looking uh, at the list that's found in Philippians chapter 4 uh, and verse 8 and being encouraged by that, hopefully, uh, to, to change how we think and to uh, submit our thoughts uh, to the ministry of Christ and, and the presence of God uh, in our daily lives in whatever situation uh, we may find ourselves in. Uh, today we're talking about whatever is pure. And when I think about purity, uh, and I think a lot of us that grew up uh, in the last a few decades have, in the church at least, have heard a lot about purity culture. And we think about purity in regard to uh, sexual life. Uh, we think about purity in regard to uh, lust or pornography. Um, and that is, that is very true. Like there is a, there is a need for purity uh, in the uh, relational and physical sexual aspects of our lives as people. Uh, we certainly recognize that and the scripture speaks to that. But I think sometimes in, in putting um, kind of that purity language on that one uh, specific issue, we have missed uh, the need for purity in all areas of life. Uh, to be pure, uh, to be uh, set apart to holiness, uh, this idea of being unmarred, uh, being fresh, being new, being perfect, being unsold. Uh, I think about, um, and we'll have one uh, in a few months probably, uh, a snow that falls and we can look out and we can see uh, the freshly fallen snow, maybe first thing in the morning. Uh, there's been no footprints on it. There's uh, been no uh, animals walking through it. There's not had an opportunity maybe for, for branches or anything to fall and corrupt it. And it's just that pure uh, white, that look that is uh, completely absent of blemish or spot. And the Bible uses that language, even in a place where people were largely unfamiliar uh, with snow. Uh, there were snow, like on Mount Hermon, for example, some of the tallest mountains would have snow at certain parts of the year. But uh, the Bible uses that language. Uh, Isaiah will use that language uh, about purity, uh, like fallen snow, like linen, like wool, uh, things that are unblemished. Uh, there's a verse that's, that's kind of a verse in passing, uh, but I love the, the image that it gives in speaking about the, the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, this is in Mark 9. Uh, it says in Mark 9 and verse 2, Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John 
and led them on a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured. His, his appearance was changed uh, before then. And verse 3 says, and I love this, the vividness of this description, his clothes became shining, exceedingly white, like snow, which no launderer on earth can whiten them. Uh, we've all had the experience of, of wearing a white shirt, uh, maybe solid white, and you get one little stain on it, and uh, that's what everyone's uh, eye is drawn to. Um, it's, it's very easy for us to picture uh, this idea of something that is that is unadulterated, something that is pure. Uh, it hasn't been corrupted in any way. Uh, and yet, uh, it's sometimes hard for us to take that physical image and put that, uh, lay that over top of uh, the spiritual life and make spiritual application from it. Uh, so today, that's my goal uh, as we share these thoughts together is thinking about uh, recognizing uh, God's purity and God is the source of purity and how we can conform our lives uh, through our thoughts and through our actions uh, to that purity that he sets before us. The first thing that I think um, is important for us to consider is that it is the recognition of God's purity, his set-apartness, his holiness, his being off by himself uh, that makes us aware of our own uh, impurity. Um, if I am... Uh, in the midst of, of lots of other people who are saying the same things, doing the same things, thinking the same things, uh, I don't recognize um, a, a difference. I, I just can blend in with that group. Maybe we're all fans of the same team uh, or we're all uh, wearing the same uh, clothing. Maybe we're at a funeral uh, and everyone is uh, dressed formally or maybe we're at a wedding. Uh, Amory and I attended a, a wedding uh, last weekend uh, Will Rawson, Bobby Rawson's son, I got married down in Mississippi, and uh, all of the groomsmen were wearing um, uh, suits that, that were blue. They were a, a beautiful uh, suit, but you could tell that they were to be set apart from everybody else because they were wearing uh, that certain outfit. They were coordinated, uh, but if you didn't know the guys that well, uh, there were several of them, uh, you might not have been able to tell them apart. You knew that they were groomsmen, uh, but you might not have known uh, their name or known who they were individually. And sometimes we have kind of that herd mentality uh, when it comes to, to spiritual things. Uh, we look around us rather than looking to uh, the one who is set apart, our one example. I want to mention from uh, Isaiah, I mentioned Isaiah chapter 1 just a moment ago, but in Isaiah uh, chapter 6, that famous uh, throne room scene uh, that is there, uh, Isaiah is, is experiencing his call to be a prophet, and he's describing that. Um, and he, he pictures um, this, this vivid uh, scene of the Lord seated on a throne, high and lifted up. Uh, the train of his robe filled the temple. You know, it's this beautiful, awesome, uh, fearful even uh, scene. And, uh, you know, his voice is speaking. Um, uh, the the um, angels are crying out. Uh, you know, the, the temple is filled with this incense, this smoke. Uh, and when Isaiah sees this, his response in verse 5 is this, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, or the Lord God uh, Almighty. What I think is interesting about that is um, Isaiah's eyes, of course, are drawn to uh, this this vivid uh, image of God, this 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 um, this vision that he is experiencing. But when he sees the holiness of God, when he sees the purity of God, when he sees that God is high and lifted up, so far above uh, anything else, his response is not just to praise God. His response is that he recognizes his own unholiness, his own impurity. Uh, comparison to God's holiness uh, should always make us tremble at our unholiness. Um, we live in a world that is very, um, uh, and, and by world I mean our particular Western American context, um, we live in a world that is very averse to things being set apart. Uh, we like for things to be casual, uh, whether that's our dress or whether that's our terms of of address, uh, you know, we'll see maybe uh, when we talked about nobility uh, a couple of weeks ago, the idea of titles and, uh, you know, uh, in countries where there's royalty and the, the formal way in which uh, those people are addressed, we, we think of ourselves as 
uh, a democracy. We think of ourselves as having a very uh, republic type feel uh, where everyone is equal. We might call someone doctor uh, if they have a doctorate. We might call someone uh, your honor, maybe if they're a judge. Um, but we don't use a lot of, of, of uh, separating language. But when Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up, he recognizes immediately the separation uh, in power, the separation in grandeur, and of course the separation in purity, the separation in holiness. Uh, to be pure um, uh, in this case is, is God's uh, perfection is the standard. And when he looks at his own life and he looks at the world uh, in which he lives and the people around him, uh, he sees how impure, how unclean uh, they are. I think one of the things that, that sometimes is a struggle for us, and it's a very uh, easy temptation uh, to fall into as people, uh, is that when uh, we are faced with our own impurity, um, when we are faced with uh, a standard that we don't think we can meet and we can't meet in ourselves, uh, the standard of God's holiness, for example, uh, we tend to look around and base our purity or our holiness or our godliness on the people that we are with, uh, on the people that surround us. We make it a comparative thing. We judge our purity based on others' impurity. Think about the elder brother uh, in the story of the prodigal son. We were looking at that this past week uh, over at the Greenfield Church on Wednesday night. And, and one of the things that the older brother does immediately is he, instead of comparing himself to the grace of his father, the goodness of his father, the love of his father, he compares his own moral record to that of his, his wasteful, prodigal, uh, riotous brother. Uh, it's really easy, right, to, instead of holding ourselves to the standard of, of purity or holiness uh, that God desires of us, uh, to simply say that we're a little bit better uh, than the people around us. We think about in Luke chapter 18 with the Pharisee and the tax collector. Um, the Pharisee, um, of course, Jesus is telling this to illustrate this very point. He sets himself up um, as more equal to God than he is to the tax collector. He sees himself as, as valuable. Uh, he even thanks God that he's not like the tax collector, uh, who is an unholy person, an impure person, a person who is unclean uh, because of his profession and, and the, the uh, sinful activities that he's likely to have engaged in. Um, Israel did this, right, in the Old Testament. God wanted Israel to be a light to the nations, and yet Israel became insular, um, and was guilty of comparing themselves uh, to the nations around them. Eventually, God would use, uh, Habakkuk points this out, as well as Daniel and others, uh, uh, Jeremiah, God would use wicked nations to punish uh, his people. Uh, they were uh, without the light of God, uh, and yet God used them to punish people who should have uh, been more dedicated to holiness, should have been in closer relationship with him. We see this again, of course, in the New Testament with the Pharisees, and this constant... Uh, battle for purity and ceremonial cleanliness uh, that they set up as being far more important than how they actually acted uh, towards others. Uh, they cared more about the appearance. Uh, Jesus will talk about in Matthew chapter 23, for example. They would clean, you know, the outside of the cup, uh, but it, the inside was filthy and rotten. Uh, they wanted to give the appearance of holiness uh, and the appearance of purity, and they would go to great lengths to do that. Uh, without ever truly being uh, conformed uh, to the holiness that God desired. Uh, of course, this happens with us as well. Um, uh, this happens with us all the time. Uh, we struggle maybe with something that is unseen. Uh, we struggle with something that's more socially acceptable. Uh, we struggle with something that uh, seems a little bit less offensive in light of other people's uh, notorious uh, sins. Uh, as the scripture speaks about uh, about the sinful people that would come to Jesus, they were known to be sinful, uh, publicly sinful, whether that was sexual sin or their profession or, or whatever the case might have been. Um, we have to be very careful uh, that we take God and God's word and the example of Jesus as the standards of a truly pure life. My standard is not to be a little bit more pure than my neighbor's. If my neighbors are watching an R-rated movie, I don't need to watch a PG-13 rated movie and think that makes me a better person. Um, I think we, we do that though. Uh, we, we give thanks sometimes that we're not like other people. Uh, we're not like the sinful people around us. Uh, and yet, uh, if we're not careful, we allow our standard 
uh, to simply be slightly elevated above those around us rather than looking to uh, the standard of God's holiness. If we are committed, as Paul tells us here in Philippians 4, to meditating on whatever things are pure, um, we have to be committed to letting our faults uh, consider the holiness and the perfection of God. Uh, it's not enough to just think a little more purely uh, than the corrupt people around us who may not uh, know God's word, may not have uh, any sense of what God wants of them in their lives. Um, it's not, um, it doesn't do us uh, any good uh, to set ourselves up as the standard or to say that, well, they're so bad and I'm not that bad. We instead need to look to the perfect standard uh, of God's majesty, his holiness. And I think we will say then, um, when we see that clearly with Isaiah, you know, I'm undone. Uh, the only thing that's going to help me is God's mercy. Because if I stand in my own strength and in my own purity, uh, I can't look upon I can't look upon His holiness. With that being said, where does our impurity come from? If we're if we're trying to think purely and be pure and and have God as a standard of purity, uh, where does our um, standard of purity come from? Where does uh, where does the impurity then um, that that we can see in ourselves? How do we how do we recognize that and where does it come from? I believe that impurity um, almost always and perhaps always in one degree or another arises from the corruption uh, of holy desire. And what do I mean by that? Uh, if purity is seen in God and his absolute holiness, uh, if that's the standard, uh, then our impurity, I think we can say, arises from our tendency to corrupt that holiness or to corrupt uh, that, that standard uh, through shortcuts uh, through self-deception, uh, through thinking we can do a little bit and not uh, sacrifice our purity. I want to give some, some examples of this because I think that we see this all through Scripture. I don't think we think about these things as purity issues uh, because in Scripture we're maybe thinking about foods or we're thinking about uh, the marriages with, with, with other uh, religious backgrounds that are condemned in the Old Testament or we're thinking about the lepers who are physically unclean as well as ceremonially uh, impure under the law of Moses. Um, we're thinking about in those terms, but again and again and again, this idea of a shortcut to a holy desire uh, leading to corruption, leading to the impurity of the people is present. I think about in Exodus chapter 32, for example, uh, Moses has gone up on the mountain. The people are waiting uh, in the valley below. Moses isn't real quick in coming down, and they tell Aaron to uh, to make them gods you know, uh, to, 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 to build an idol for them. They want to hear from the divine. Uh, they are worried, they are fearful, uh, and they want to worship, at least in their mind. Um, and so they take a shortcut. Uh, we don't know what's happened to Moses. Where can Moses be? Uh, you know, we just left this land of idolatry. Make us an idol that we can see that can go uh, before us. They turn the good desire for worship into idolatry. I think that's why that's reflected, of course, in the Ten uh, Commandments, the, the prohibitions against idolatry. There's also this idea of, of love, uh, marital love, sexual love, um, the love of family that is, that is good, uh, that is a holy thing, that is a pure thing uh, in the mind of God, but it is corrupted through lust. We can think about 2 Samuel, really beginning with chapter 11 and going all the way through the end of the book, the latter years of David's reign, and how his desire um, uh, for uh, companionship and fulfillment and sexual fulfillment uh, that he could have fulfilled in, in any number of godly ways, uh, he instead uh, carries out in his lustful uh, seizing of Bathsheba. And that ethic, that lust feel, that craving ethic that brings that impurity into his life that he spends a lot of time trying to cover up, it not only corrupts his heart for a season, uh, it corrupts his family. It, cor it impacts his children. Um, love, sexual love, passion, is a good thing. Um, it's something that's given, that's present to us in this life, but it can so easily be uh, corrupted and made impure when it's fulfilled in the wrong ways. Think about appetite. All of us have appetite uh, when it comes to hunger and, and food. Um, God gives us all things richly to enjoy. Uh, in the Garden of Eden, he provides all of these things that are good for food to strengthen the body. Uh, the writers of the wisdom literature of the Old Testament will tell us again and again and again 
uh, of the importance of, of enjoying our, our eating and drinking and celebrating uh, because they're gifts from God. But very quickly, uh, appetite that is God-given and meant to be fulfilled uh, in godly ways can become drunkenness, can become gluttony, uh, can become the hoarding of uh, whether it's food or possessions uh, and, and keeping them for ourselves uh, to fatten ourselves, to, to fulfill uh, ourselves over and over and over, even while others suffer. Uh, think about industry and hard work. The Bible again and again and again praises the importance of work. And yet, 1 Timothy chapter 6 will tell us uh, that the desire for riches can become a snare. Um, it's good to work and to provide for your family, to provide for the Lord's work, uh, to be able to, to support those who are preaching and, and ministering full-time uh, so that they can give themselves fully to the work of the Lord. If that's what we're working hard for uh, and we're doing that in a way that acknowledges God's sovereignty, that's great, but it can very easily industry and hard work and a good work ethic can lead us to greed. It can lead us to um, uh, covetousness. It can lead us to uh, e the idolatry of possessions. It can lead us to building bigger barns uh, while people around us go hungry. If impurity comes from the corruption, then, of God-given desires, then the path back to where God wants us to be when it comes to purity, it has to return the desires of our heart um, the Puritans would call these the affections, the holy affections. Uh, the desires of our heart have to be uh, returned and renewed uh, and refocused on God uh, and His purity and His holiness. And our motivation then for all that we do has to be centered in His purity and in His holiness. I want to mention um, from the book of Romans, uh, this is a, a passage that we look at often in Romans chapter 12, um, and this is, again, Paul writing, um, and he's talking about living sacrifices. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, or I entreat you, I ask you, I beg you, uh, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, verse 2 says this. This is Romans 12 and verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, its standards of purity, its mindset about holiness, its activities when it comes to spiritual things, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Um, the world wants us to conform. The world says if it feels good, do it. Um, it's, it doesn't matter that it's uh, not exactly right. It doesn't matter that other people might be affected. It doesn't matter that even if no one else knows about it, your heart and your affections are being turned away from God. Uh, through this overindulgence, through this uh, impurity of thought and action that's coming into your life. Paul says we can't do that and be faithful followers of Christ. We have to instead, instead of conforming and becoming like everyone else in the standard uh, of purity that everyone else uses, the standard of holiness and goodness and godliness that everyone else uses, we have to be transformed uh, and renewed and brought back to uh, the perfect will of God. And this will be the last point I'll make and. Uh, I think that this is this is where the rubber meets the road, right? Um, you know, we can acknowledge that God is our standard. Uh, we can acknowledge that we often take shortcuts trying to get what we uh, want. Um, you know, whether that's uh, in our worship or whether that's in our relationships, uh, and that we often have impure motives uh, in doing that and in taking those shortcuts. We're trying to avoid sacrifice. We're trying to conform rather than be transformed. But I think it's very important for us to realize that purity of action, purity in what we say and do outwardly, uh, as Paul says again here in Philippians chapter 4, um, that comes from what we meditate on and what we think on and what we take into our heart uh, day in and day out. Paul reminds us um, you know, that, that if we do these things, if we meditate and think on these things, God will be with us, uh, the noble, the just. And of course here, uh, the pure. Our thoughts are powerful. Um, Jesus acknowledges this in Matthew chapter 5. In the Sermon on the Mount, in, in probably the most well-known and important sermon ever preached, uh, arguably, uh, in the history of the world, Jesus tells us that adultery, that murder, that they're not just outward things, that they begin in the heart, and that when we allow hatred to build in our heart, or lust to build in our heart, or anger to build in our heart, uh, or uh, desire for things that are not ours, covetousness, to build in our heart, 
it will ultimately come out in our lives. Um, it's already spiritually damaging. It's already a sin uh, for us when we allow those things to take root in our heart and begin to bear fruit inwardly. But none of those things ever happen outwardly without first beginning uh, in the heart. What we choose to think about will either draw us nearer to God uh, as we live from day to day, um, as we think about things that are holy, things that are good, things that are right, things that are pure, or um, what we think about will resist the work and the growth that God uh, longs for us to experience as his people, the things that he's wanting to do uh, in our lives. Um, we've been t studying James in our Sunday morning uh, adult Bible class uh, at 9 o'clock, and one of the things that, that we've mentioned the last couple of weeks in James 1 is this idea of, of prayer uh, and being double-minded. And I think purity, um, much like prayer, is one of those things where uh, we kind of want our cake and eat it too. We want to indulge uh, our thoughts or we want to indulge uh, our um, slightly better than others impurities. Uh, and yet we still want the closeness uh, and intimacy with God. And as Christians, we, we, we often fluctuate back and forth. We'll spend all day conforming and then we'll try to pray and transform. Um, certainly God is, is gracious and looking to forgive. But I think it's important that we are intentional about thinking on the things of the Spirit, that we are intentional about removing the things of the flesh and the temptations of the flesh uh, from our path each day, um, that we not only resist them when they come, but we actively avoid getting in situations where we're called upon uh, to resist insofar as it depends uh, on us. In James chapter 1, I'll just mention briefly, uh, in verse 13, we'll be looking at this passage, uh, Lord willing, uh, in, in person today too in our class time. Uh, but it, it plays very well here. I think it fits very well in this context. Uh, it says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, uh, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one, each person, is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, uh, brings forth death. We have to be very, very aware of our thinking and our thoughts. And I, I find this is something that I struggle with a lot. Um, a lot of times we will be very uh, aware of what others think of us. We'll be very aware of what we say in public. Uh, we'll be very aware of, of maybe... Um, you know, the, the things that we display, the teams that we support, the candidates we support. We can be very aware of, of how that plays in the minds of others. And again, sometimes that's more of a comparison with, with other people as the standard rather than looking to God's holiness. But many of us, myself included quite often, are too unguarded in our thoughts. Um, James here mentions this, this desire, um, the desire that leads us away from where God would have us to be. There is a point at which a desire is not sinful. Um, there is a point at which uh, we can, uh, to use our previous examples, uh, you know, wonder where God is in a particular situation and yet not build an idol. Or we can acknowledge uh, someone's beauty or attractiveness and yet not allow that, that sin of lust to take root uh, in our heart uh, and, and begin to build to the point that not only does it corrupt our heart, but it corrupts our actions and impacts uh, everyone around us. Um, we can push back from the table, right? Uh, the desire for food, the, des the appetite for food or sex or joy or pleasure or laughter, those are all God-given. Um, but the difference comes in, am I willing to let that desire pass or am I willing to let that desire be fulfilled in God-honoring ways or am I being drawn in uh, into a sinful situation, into a situation that corrupts my heart, my, my mind, my words, my outward actions. Um, when we conform, we allow desire to take free reign. When we seek to be transformed, we want our mind to be renewed. We want it to be refreshed. We want it to be as Christ was uh, at the transfiguration, his transformation. We want it to be exceedingly pure. Um, and I think that that's important for us to consider. Um, there's a danger in saying all desire is wrong or all desire is sinful. Uh, it's not. We wouldn't be where we are without desire. Uh, you've had desire to eat this morning, probably. You had desire to go to sleep last night. Those are physical desires. 
um, uh, comfort, warmth, uh, sexual fulfillment. Those are desires uh, that we have. But are we allowing those desires to steer our whole life and, and we're fulfilling them uh, without any regard for others or for our own uh, purity and holiness and for the honor of God? Or are we um, choosing to transform those desires uh, to bring us closer to Christ? The last thing that I'll mention is from Galatians. Uh, and I think this, this plays into, again, this, this conversation very well. Um, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16, Paul writes, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Um, in other words, live according to the spiritual, uh, and we can put to death or at least um, place in their proper uh, ways the desires of the flesh. Not all fleshly desires are sinful. Um, the Bible uses the word flesh in multiple ways. Um, physical desire is not wrong. Um, the mind that is corrupted and driven only by the fulfillment of sexual desire is driven by the flesh. Paul will say again in that same chapter in verse 24, And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. When we live in this life, um, we're going to have desire. We're going to have um, passions, uh, things that are um, important to us that drive us at, at even just a physical level. The question is, are we going to meditate and think and respond to desire in a way that is God-honoring? Some desires have to be put to death. Um, they're, they're not acceptable to be fulfilled except in the ways that God has uh, chosen to give us to fulfill them. And yet, uh, many of us, we we put our desire down, uh, but we don't put it to death. We certainly don't crucify it. We don't do the painful thing of taking it out of our lives completely. We put it down and we fulfill it in smaller ways or we, or we um, pacify the desire with smaller concessions. And what I think is true in Scripture, and it's true for us as well, is that if we take um, desires and we are not willing to subject them to the authority of Christ, if we're not willing to stop um, just being a little bit better than the world, but instead to seek a transformed life, a resurrected life, a renewed life, um, those desires take root and they grow. And eventually um, they become sinful. Uh, and eventually if they're not dealt with, they lead to death, uh, the spiritual death uh, that, we, that we seek to avoid. Um, when we think about purity, uh, I want that image of exceedingly pure, exceedingly white, to be at the forefront of our minds. Um, we stand in Christ pure. Um, one of the great things about the imagery of baptism is the idea that it is the, uh, the putting to death of the old person, the rising in a new life, a new creation, as Romans 6 talks about. Um, we need to remember that. And as we live life from day to day, and as we're walking in the Spirit, uh, as we're walking in the light, as 1 John 1 says, the blood of Christ is continually cleansing us uh, from all sin. I don't want to compromise purity in any area of life in such a way that it puts separation between me uh, and God. I don't want my standard to be slightly better than my neighbors or slightly better uh, than my friends. I want my standard to be God's holiness. Knowing that I will fall short of that without his forgiveness and his grace, and yet striving uh, to live my life in a way where my thoughts, my actions, my words are pure. I'm not thinking one thing and doing another. I'm not being that hypocrite. I instead am living purely and wholly uh, into the presence of God. It takes intention. It takes the presence of God's word and the presence of God's spirit. Um, and it also takes, I think, um, pain and being willing to say, uh, these desires uh, are here whether that's for food, whether that's for sex, whether that's for um, uh, to be thought well of, uh, whether that's pride or vanity, um, whatever they are, they're here. I acknowledge them, I see them, and I choose to turn away from them. I choose to turn away from conforming simply to these base desires, and instead I choose to be renewed uh, and refreshed in the presence of Christ. It's a difficult thing, um, but one that we're called to. Uh, and the more we think about it, the purer our life will be, uh, our words, our actions, and our thoughts all tied together 
uh, and conformed to the purity of God. Appreciate your good uh, attention uh, today. And uh, this was a difficult lesson for me. It's, it's such a big topic, um, but I think it's helpful for us to think about um, what our standard is and how we need to be seeking, uh, seeking that uh, day in and day out. Let's take a moment, and if you have your communion supplies, you can go ahead uh, and be getting those out. And uh, as I say each week, uh, if you're with others and uh, taking communion together, uh, feel free to turn me off. Uh, read from uh, 1 Corinthians 11, uh, for example, uh, a great passage in 1 Corinthians uh, 10 and 11 about purity, uh, what their motives were at the Lord's Supper and what ours ought to be uh, as well. So that fits well uh, again today. Um, but we'll pray first here for the bread. And then we'll pray for the cup. And uh, I'll say those prayers back to back. Take the time that you need. Uh, and then we'll take our announcement time together. Let's pray first for the bread. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this bread, which for us as Christians reminds us of the body of Christ that was given on the cross. Lord, we recognize that um, in his flesh he suffered so that we might have forgiveness and that we might have hope. And we ask that our minds would go back to the sacrifice of his body that was given for us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. And let's pray also for the cup at this time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are likewise thankful for the cup, the fruit of the vine, and the fact that for us as believers, it brings our minds back to the blood of Christ that was given on the cross. We thank you for that blood that as we are washed in it and walking in your light, that it continually cleanses us. Help us, Lord, to put aside the impurities that rise so often within us and to look to Jesus as our example. And as we take this cup today, help us to be reminded um, that we look back to the cross and we also look forward to his coming. And let us proclaim that in the way that we live each and every day. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Again, glad to uh, see each one of you today uh, and to be able to share this time together. Reminder, we will be meeting uh, at 9, 10, and 5 uh, today, Lord willing, at the church building on Lebanon Church Road in Dresden. And if you're in our area, uh, we'd love to see you there. If you're part of our local uh, congregation and uh, need to give your offering uh, and have that and want to do that, need to do that, uh, just let us know and we'll be uh, glad to pick that up or you can bring that, of course, the next time that you're with us having um, set that aside today. Uh, we do have some birthdays and anniversaries coming up this week. Uh, today, the 23rd, is Chris Culver's uh, birthday. It's also Logan and Casey Perkins' anniversary. And so they are celebrating two little blessings this year, uh, having uh, had Miss Eliza come in. Uh, so uh, wish them a happy anniversary as well. Uh, this week on the 27th, that's Thursday, that'll be Randy and Pam English's anniversary. And then on Friday, the 28th, that's Ricky and Dolores' uh, anniversary and uh, thankful for both those couples. And then on Saturday, uh, Paige Vaughn uh, will have her birthday, and Abby Young, uh, Mike and uh, Norma's granddaughter, will be having her birthday uh, as well on Saturday. So a big week of celebrations for those folks, and uh, we want to uh, remember all of them and, and congratulate them on these milestones that they're reaching uh, this week. Um, next Sunday, we'll be doing things a little bit differently. I plan to have a pre-recorded uh, message here online. I'll try to do that and get that shared a little bit in advance. But Todd Hampton will be with us at the building uh, on Sunday, June 30th, next Sunday. Uh, he will be teaching our 9 a.m. Bible class uh, for adults, and then we'll be preaching at 10. There will be no uh, evening service, so no evening service uh, on June 30th. We'll have our service tonight on the 23rd as normal, uh, but no evening service on June 30th. Uh, Anne-Marie and I will be out of town uh, and traveling with our family uh, on that day. And uh, so uh, we will, will not have our discussion class that night. 
Uh, we want to continue to remember Todd. Uh, his mom passed away uh, after a long battle uh, and being on hospice. Uh, she passed away this past week and her services were Wednesday uh, in Union City. So we want to remember Todd and his family. Uh, but I've spoken with him and he is looking forward to being with us uh, on the 30th. Um, also, this coming week, uh, tomorrow night, in fact, at Doris Chapel uh, down near Trenton, uh, Yorkville, the central community, uh, I'll be speaking at 7 p.m. Uh, on their uh, Vacation Bible School. They have an adult class uh, each night. Uh, Lord willing, Brent Arnold will be doing that tonight on Sunday night, and I will be tomorrow night. And then uh, there's a couple of other brothers, uh, Ken uh, Roberts will be on Tuesday night. They'll have a different speaker uh, each night, and that'll go through Wednesday. Uh, there will also be classes for kids, uh, so if you're looking for something to do uh, this week and, and uh, a good air-conditioned place to be at, uh, I know the folks at Doris Chapel would love uh, to see you. Tim Fuqua, uh, the, who's been the minister at Doris Chapel for many, many years, uh, is retiring, and uh, Josh Mayo, uh, who uh, is related to uh, several in our congregation, uh, Josh will be uh, taking over uh, the full-time ministry there at Doris Chapel. Uh, and uh, we wish uh, that congregation well and pray for them uh, during this time. They've been in this transition for a few months now, and uh, they'll be having a reception uh, for Tim next Monday, uh, next Sunday afternoon, rather, uh, between the morning and evening service, and I'll share about that uh, on our Facebook. I know many of you know Tim uh, from his years of driving a UPS truck, and uh, in addition to preaching there at Doris Chapel, and he has been uh, such an encouragement to me uh, through the years uh, when I was a child. Uh, and all the way up till now, we uh, try to have breakfast together occasionally uh, with a group of guys and uh, just really thankful for his ministry. But we'll be there, uh, Lord willing, tomorrow night, I will be there to speak uh, on their VBS. Um, as far as health and trials go, folks that are dealing with challenges uh, that we need to continue to remember, Tammy Dole uh, is uh, weaker, um, is at home on hospice, and uh, we just want to continue to remember Tammy uh, this week and, and her family. Uh, during this time and I uh, want to continue to reach out to them and uh, Tammy has uh, reminded me again and again to thank everyone uh, for the food that's been brought, for uh, the prayers that have been offered, for the cards that have been sent and we just want to continue to remember her uh, at this time. I also want to continue to remember Randy Marie Smith as well as Haley Hart who've had recent uh, surgeries and are recovering from those. Uh, both of them are doing well. Uh, we want to continue to remember Randy English uh, who is recovering from pneumonia and uh, is at home. I was able to see him this week, and uh, Randy's improving. Uh, we want to remember Miss Beverly Donahoe. That's Lindsay uh, Parham's mother. Um, of course, Ashley Bradbury's mother as well. Uh, we want to continue to remember um, Beverly uh, as she was diagnosed with uterine cancer, and she has a follow-up on July 2nd. Uh, they believe it's contained based on the, uh, the tests that they've done so far, uh, but they'll have a um, uh, meeting with a surgeon that day uh, to see the plan going forward. So we want to continue to remember uh, all of all of the Donahoe family uh, at this time. We want to continue to remember uh, Melba Shobe, who had a fall. Uh, we want to remember Bobby Liggett. Uh, that's John Liggett's dad, who is now at home after having uh, some heart issues last week. We want to continue to remember David Parham, who's recovering from his hamstring surgery and dealing with some blood clot issues still and taking medicine for that and is now at home. I want to remember Ann Ralston, who is Joyce Todd's daughter, who is uh, taking cancer treatments at this time. I want to continue to remember Alan Neville um, as well, uh, Dolores' brother. Uh, Miss Dolores has been um, uh, gone for uh, an annual test that she has each um, uh, periodically and uh, is uh, waiting results on that, and so we're praying for her uh, there. I want to continue to remember Lee Gwynn also, as well as Greta Hughes, uh, who's had some health issues in the last couple of weeks. Uh, with dehydration and is doing better and is at her uh, apartment there in Bales. I want to continue to remember Miss Patsy McAlpin uh, also, um, as well as Jennifer Mayo Blackstone, uh, Casey Hughes, Miss Roberta Parker, that's Andrea's mom. I want to continue to remember uh, Vicki Whitworth, that's Betsy Robinson's uh, friend who is uh, taking some long-term uh, cancer treatment. I want to continue to remember Miss Faye Robinson, who's been having some uh, stomach tests and uh, uh, having some um, uh, testing done uh, and uh, trying to figure out what uh, she's dealing with uh, health-wise. I want to continue to remember Brenda K. Burris and Ray Burris, it's Greta's uh, sister and nephew uh, who are dealing with sickness. Uh, it's been good to see 
uh, some folks out and about and I uh, want to continue to remember those who are uh, dealing with this heat. Um, obviously, we have folks in our community who are really struggling um, as far as um, with the ability to keep cool. Uh, and we certainly want to be uh, aware of that and, and thankful uh, for those who are, are seeking to uh, to check on them and, and uh, reminding us uh, to check on others as well. We have a lot of folks traveling uh, during this summer vacation. Um, that would include Anne Marie and myself this coming week and I appreciate your prayers as we travel. We do have others in our community who are dealing with sickness, um, uh, who have been on our thoughts and, um, and in our hearts and we want to continue to remember those individually uh, as well. I know our list uh, is extensive, um, but it's, I think it's good to bring those uh, to mind as well as our missionary families uh, and those who are um, in just difficult places right now, whether that's geographically uh, or spiritually. Uh, our world certainly is full of chaos, uh, and uh, at least from our perspective. And uh, we want to remember our, our leaders uh, and those who are serving in various ways uh, today. If anyone needs to be added to our list or if there's been a change uh, that I need to know about, just let me know, and I'll try to make that. Um, it's very easy uh, in this setting to leave someone off because no one's here to tell me uh, who to add or, or who to um, there might have been a change with. Uh, so if you uh, if you have one of those or, or see a need uh, to have something announced, just let us know and we'll we'll try to do that. Again, Lord willing, we'll be at the building today, uh, 9 a.m. Uh, for our class time, 10 a.m. for worship and 5 p.m. for our Bible study uh, tonight and our discussion of the church. Um, I appreciate so much your encouragement uh, from day to day and from week to week, and uh, we want to continue to think about what we think about um, and realize how our thoughts um, help us and draw us closer to God or can create a barrier uh, for us being able to grow spiritually as we would like to. Um, the more aware of it we are, uh, the more intentional we are about it, the more likely we are to truly look to God as our example and to pursue holiness, um, to draw near to him uh, and to stand in that exceeding purity that we can receive only in and through uh, the blood of Christ. Let's pray together and uh, we'll go out and face this week. Let's pray. Our Lord and Father in heaven, again, we're thankful for this day, thankful for the opportunity we have to share this time together. I ask that you would go with us through the week ahead. Help us to be conscious of what we think about Help us to be able to acknowledge the desires that we have and yet to submit those desires to your lordship, submit those desires to your will, and to fulfill them in ways that honor you. Help us, Lord, to be aware when we are allowing impurity to sneak into our hearts, to take root there. Help us to look to your word, uh, to allow it to shape us, uh, to purify us, uh, to judge our motives as well as our actions and our words. And help us, Lord, in all ways to be drawn uh, to be holy and to be pure because of the holy impurity that we see in you and in and through your Son and the life that he lived before us. Go with us now and watch over us. Strengthen us against uh, the temptations that come. Uh, strengthen us in the trials that we face. And help us in all that we do to give glory and honor uh, to you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hope everybody has a, a great week. And Lord willing, we'll see you soon. Have a great week. Bye-bye.